George Blake was a spy who had betrayed many people who were working for British intelligence. He was a highly rated, very efficient officer, a multilinguist, an agent handler. He was so damaging that it's difficult to get any official confirmation of the extent of the damage he did. Blake was 10 times as good because he was on the inside of the organization. Not just any organization, British intelligence. Many people lost their lives, not just in Germany, it was throughout the world. Battleground Berlin, the flashpoint of the Cold War. Pitting the Western Allies against the Soviet Union, competing to rule post-war Europe. It was a very scary period. It was an ethos of fear. America had the nuclear saber and was rattling it. The Soviets, we were led to believe, had an even bigger nuclear saber. So we needed people on the ground to actually make sure uh, that there was not going to be a surprise attack. And that meant that everybody was running agents everywhere. The Soviets are winning the war in the shadows. Hundreds of Western agents disappear without a trace, never to be seen or heard from again. Western intelligence agencies fear the worst. They suspect that one of their own may be a double agent. British intelligence puts their top man on the case, Harry Shergold. Shergold is shocked that there may be a high-level KGB mole within their ranks. They go to the files, and it eventually points to one person, George Blake. So they invite him back to London, ostensibly to discuss a promotion. But the double agent part of him was wary, but he had no option. He decided to do it. April 4th, 1961. London, England. Day one of George Blake's interrogation. Investigators face a daunting task to prove their former and once trusted colleague is leading a double life. People he met, he had served with for years. He'd worked with them. Harry Shergold, one or two others. And the initial atmosphere, as you know, was one of genuine bewilderment. Uh, George, can you tell us why would this information that you had sourced from a particular agent in Eastern Europe. How come it ended up here? We've invited you back, can you help us? Confronted with convincing evidence, Blake coolly denies he is a KGB mole, responsible for the deaths of countless intelligence operatives. In a search for motives, Blake's interrogators delve into his past. He was born George Behar in Rotterdam, Holland, in November 1922. Well, he's a fascinating enigma in many ways. He was born of a Dutch mother and an Egyptian Jewish British father. It's almost as if the history of Matahari was repeating itself. When he was 10 or 11 years of age, he was sent to relations in Cairo, in Alexandria, in Egypt. And there he fell under the influence of an uncle, Henri Curiel, very wealthy intellectual, who was a founder member of the Egyptian Communist Party. But it was the Nazi invasion of Holland in May of 1940 that propelled Blake into the murky world of espionage. George Blake was a teenager in Rotterdam, in Holland when the Nazis invaded. He had been studying to be a Lutheran priest, and the invasion by the Germans into Rotterdam finished that. He became violently anti-German, 
and he joined the Dutch resistance. He was only 17. He was really running messages. Let's not delude ourselves. If he'd been caught, he'd have probably been sent to the camps or shot, or both. He learned to live with danger. And I understand that he was a very effective gatherer of intelligence on the deployment of Nazi forces within Holland. And very accurate in his pinpointing of troop movements, with the result that you could say that he was responsible for the successful ambushing by the Dutch resistance of German forces. He survived, I think, two and a half years in occupied Holland, which is flat, has no tree cover, no mountains. It's like being a spy on a billiard table. So he must have been very good. But then he drifted into the British Navy, given officer training under the emergency wartime regulations, and then commissioned. He then became a conducting officer. That is the officer in charge of a secret agent. In 1944, George Blake joined the Secret Intelligence Service, or SIS. He was assigned to MI6, the British Secret Service's foreign intelligence office. Almost 20 years later, Blake's interrogators would pore over every detail of his past, looking for patterns, but they couldn't find any. Blake had meticulously covered his trail. By 1947, Blake's star was on the rise within British intelligence. MI6 sent him to learn Russian at Cambridge University. He had a promising career in British intelligence ahead of him. He was posted to Seoul in Korea under cover of the legation as a vice consul. And his job was to assess for the British the likely influence of communist infiltration from the north. In June 1950, North Korea, with the backing of the Soviets, attacked South Korea. The United Nations condemned the invasion, ultimately sending a multinational force to repel the North Koreans. Apparently, the orders from London were that the British legation should stay until the very end. Blake burned the secret codes of the embassy, went out to negotiate with the communists, was captured as a diplomat. As a prisoner of war, Blake was subjected to a grueling death march. Among his fellow prisoners was Philip Dean, a war reporter from London's Observer, who was also secretly working for British intelligence. We walked through the Diamond Mountains. We were given one handful of boiled maize. It was a three-month trek under extremely harsh conditions. Nearly half of the 750 prisoners died. The American soldiers were dying like flies. And when one of us tried to help an American soldier move, the major in charge would just shoot him between the eyes. Subjected to unspeakable conditions, both Blake and Dean were victims of communist brainwashing techniques. Blake and I were people that were trying to turn. And in addition to eating 600 calories a day and f freezing, we had to face brainwashing, a technique whereby they humiliate you so that you lose your manhood. I do think that the pressures of captivity accelerated his innate sympathy for communism. And when he saw the American planes coming in to bomb the villagers, because the Americans, they thought every native in a rice field was a communist subversive. 
And so they did mass bombing. And according to Blake's own account, that evoked in him the repetition of the fear and the disgust that he'd seen when the Nazi planes flew over Rotterdam. He was ruminating on the great questions of humanity. What is right, what is wrong, and which side am I on? Shortly after, Blake made his fateful decision to switch sides and work for the Soviets. Approaching the guard room, he passed a note addressed to the Soviet embassy in North Korea, requesting an interview with a KGB officer. He offered to reveal all British operations directed against the Soviet Union and other socialist bloc countries. Blake disappeared uh, for uh, some time. And we were wondering what happened to him. And he returned looking better fed <laughs> than usual and cleaner. And uh, we wonder where he'd gone. He said he tried to escape and got lost, and they caught him. We know later that people came from the Soviet Union to speak to him and tell him how to behave hereafter. There is a very subtle and very dangerous difference between breaking telling them more than your name, rank, and number, and volunteering information that you know could be detrimental to the security of your country. That is the difference between breaking under stress and being a traitor. Blake's conversion to communism became the focus of attention for chief interrogator Harry Shergold. Why had he done it? Had he been tortured, brainwashed, or was he a true believer in the Soviet system? Blake himself claimed at one point that he became uh, attracted to communism uh, after reading Marx in captivity. Well, he must have been into pain in a big way because anybody who's tried to read Marx and understand it, given the horror of captivity, uh, has got to be into pain in a big way. Despite the pressure, Blake was denying he was a Soviet spy. He did admit that he had been deeply disturbed by the suffering of the North Koreans as a result of heavy American bombing. Shergold now changed tactics, zeroing in on Blake's psyche. He knew that his social standing was a source of bitterness. To his fellow British prisoners in Korea, Blake was first and foremost a Jew. I saw it first hand. And when we talked, walking up and down, he said, you know, uh, we'll never forget that I'm a, I'm a Jew. Now, I believe that part of Blake's decision to turn traitor may well have been the simple fact that he realized he would never be one of us, to use that expression. He would always be George Blake, Brave chap, decorated, brilliant linguist, suave, sophisticated debonair, but not quite one of us. Looked down upon by his colleagues, Blake was welcomed with open arms by the Soviets. The best type of agent that they dreamed about. They used to lie abed in the Lubyanka at night fantasizing was George Blake type agents. Didn't want any money, didn't want any glory, did it for the cause. The best type of agent, because an agent who does it for money, can you really trust the information they're giving you? Or are they making it up to get money? But Blake was an ideological agent, the best type. Blake wouldn't budge. Still no breakthroughs and plenty of questions. How had their fellow spy avoided detection after returning from Korea? How did he establish himself as the KGB's most valuable mole within British intelligence, passing on the West's most important secrets and compromising its best agents? George Blake's interrogation was turning into a high-stakes chess match. Former colleague Harry Shergold 
wanted to know how Blake had managed to slip through the cracks after Korea. An RAF Hastings aircraft lands at Abingdon, bringing home seven civilians released at last from captivity in North Korea. Here to greet them are many of their friends. When George came back from Korea, he had a period of recuperation. He was regarded as a hero within the service. And also, he had been damaged. They could see he'd been damaged. He'd, he'd undergone dreadful physical deprivation. Followed by Mr. George Blake of the Seoul Legation Staff. All the men have been in communist internment camps for nearly three years. And friends who knew them before that time say how great... As a returning hero, Blake managed to avoid any suspicion. No one knew he had changed sides and was now working for the KGB. His intelligence debriefing at SIS headquarters in London lasted only one day. To think that a man who would suffered under the hands of North Korean communists would become a communist spy is hard to grasp. In fact, I would suggest that the fact that he had done that for three years probably made him more trustworthy than less trustworthy. Blake was your actual officer class agent. And here he was coming back from captivity for nearly three years. And his colleagues at desks in London who comfortably rode up and down on the train every day, and you know, and had lunch in the pub around the corner and so on, they had to be a bit in awe of him. The fact that Blake remained undetected for so long after his release from North Korea you can put it down to conspiracy, or you can put it down to rank incompetence. And knowing the history of the British intelligence services of that era, I'd love to be able to say it was conspiracy, but I'm sorry, it wasn't. It was stark staring incompetence. Blake soon went to work at a senior level in SIS's Y section. Y section's job was to listen to all the Eastern European embassies in London, especially the Soviet embassy and the Czech embassy. And when there were delegations from behind the Iron Curtain, Y section marked their rooms and they were looking for potential defectors. And the irony is that the head of the section was the great defector <laughs> to the Russians. Blake was able to keep his secret from everyone including Gillian Allen, a young secretary at Y section whom he began to date. They married in the fall of 1954 and started a family. Blake was leading a risky double life, conducting clandestine meetings around London with his KGB contact and turning over detailed lists of covert surveillance operations against Soviet targets. Now, the Russians had given him a camera, which he put sometimes in his briefcase, and there were very random searches, and sometimes he carried in his back pocket. And he developed great expertise. Blake would use the lunch hour as a window of opportunity. He used to stay behind in the lunch hour. That wasn't a guard as unusual, but he was able to close doors, quickly photograph very important documents, sometimes go into other people's offices and photograph available documents. And so he was leading the double life. He was turning up like a civil servant, pinstripe suit, brolly, etc., briefcase, pillar of the British establishment, and at lunch hour, working for the Russians. He would then deliver the goods to his controller at a station on the underground line. Blake gave information that could enable people on the very top of Soviet government to arrive at important decisions, or to let them understand how the other side was working against them and how it was thinking and plotting against the Soviet Union. That's very important. In London, Blake had been spying for the Soviets from 1953 to 1955. He was now ready for the big time. Berlin, the center of the Cold War, where he would reach the pinnacle of his career. Using his high-level position in British intelligence, 
to identify and betray hundreds of agents operating behind enemy lines. In the spring of 1955, the Cold War is becoming dangerously hot. Berlin is the spy capital of the world, where Soviet and Allied intelligence agencies are locked in a deadly game of cat and mouse. Enter George Blake, one of British intelligence's most trusted and talented officers. He'd been transferred from London to West Berlin's Olympic Stadium buildings, home to the largest SIS station in the world. His orders, infiltrate Soviet intelligence headquarters in East Berlin and make contact with Soviet operatives. He's recruiting existing Stasi-type agents to work for the British. But of course, because he is already a senior Russian agent, the Russians are able to make it easy for him. They're able to put some people his way. So his status within the British intelligence community goes up. He appears very capable of what he's doing. Blake's Berlin appointment is a major coup for the KGB. Their mole is now at the heart of British intelligence operations, leading many to believe his timely arrival is a lot more than sheer coincidence. Isn't it obvious? He was promoted. Who promoted him? Someone who wanted a Soviet agent promoted into sensitive and important roles. In other words, there were people above Blake in British intelligence. The fourth man, the fifth man, and for we know, the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth men, who were running their own little private corporations with Soviet assistance and dedication. The high-level ideologicals who've never been caught. Blake is passing staggering amounts of sensitive information, detailing everything from classified intelligence operations to Allied troop movements and high-level political decisions. These meetings take place over five years. There's no one like him. There never will be. He was unique. You can describe Blake with only one word, unique. In Berlin, he was in a position to see all intelligence activities. His office was just down the corridor from the offices of the, of the British mission, and there was very close contact on a daily basis there. He received all the tour plans from us. He also received briefings from all the other intelligence agencies. So he had total visibility of what was actually happening in Berlin. For Harry Shergold and company, the evidence is overwhelming. The conclusions startling. Blake was almost single-handedly responsible for disrupting Western intelligence gathering in West Berlin, including tipping off the Soviets to one of the most daring espionage operations of the entire Cold War, the Berlin Tunnel. It was codenamed Operation Gold, a secret 500-meter underground tunnel running from west to east Berlin built to infiltrate the Iron Curtain by tapping into the main Soviet phone lines. It was an enormous operation, involving tunnel experts, telephone and recording engineers, and teams of transcribers and translators. A special air service would take the information to London daily for processing. However, the secretary for the Joint British-American Intelligence Committee, responsible for planning the tunnel, was none other than George Blake. He kept the minutes at the meetings between the CIA and SIS and handed over the committee's every decision to his KGB controller. He compromised every top secret operation before it began. This information was priceless. Just imagine what could have happened if this British operation succeeded. Our damage would be huge, because all our confidential secrets would have been known to our potential enemy. 
For the Soviets, uncovering the tunnel was a huge propaganda victory. And yet, the KGB waited almost a year before halting the tunnel's operation. In the West, we embrace technology, we love technology, and we tolerate human intelligence. But the Soviets believed that human intelligence was so important that they would do all kinds of things to protect them. And the fact that George Blake was there and compromised it at the beginning, but they let it be built and they let it operate for 11 months shows how important George Blake was to them. But how important was the information the West intercepted in the tunnel? That is still one of the great unanswered questions of the Cold War. It was much, much more than just military communication. They recorded almost half a million telephone conversations, and what perhaps was even more important, they also had access to the Soviet telex system, and that produced three to 400 meters of information every day. They were receiving purely tactical information. Information of strategic importance was not relayed through the Berlin Tunnel. And if it was, it was disinformation. In the eyes of his interrogators, exposing the tunnel was extremely damaging. But Blake's biggest transgression was identifying and betraying hundreds of Western intelligence agents operating in the Soviet bloc. As Harry Shergold was discovering, George Blake's most damaging and sinister work involved exposing fellow agents to the KGB. In my opinion, his most important work for Soviet intelligence, from the strategic point of view, was Blake's information on British agents who were sent to Balkan countries and the Soviet Union after World War II. In the 50s and the beginning of the 60s. As a result, several hundred agents were arrested thanks to Blake's information. There is no doubt that he contributed to the deaths of many brave men and women. There will always be arguments over the number. I've heard as many as 400, I've heard as few as 150. But to cause the death of even one agent is unspeakable. That's what spies do. I mean, it's a dangerous, bad, dirty game. Uh, he knew what he was going into. He, he, he says that himself. He said that the business he was in, working in London, that he could sometimes effectively order the death of somebody. Intelligence services are the sanitation system of government. Without them, it would smell pretty badly after a few days. They're absolutely necessary, but intelligence apparat people are sanitation workers. That's all. And the smelly stuff sticks after a while, and you never feel really clean. Incredibly, Blake would later claim that the KGB had assured him that none of the agents he betrayed would be harmed. This demand was met, but you should consider that some agents could have fought back during the arrest and could have been killed in a shootout. And those agents who were arrested alive, they were convicted, but none of them received a death sentence. So the KGB kept its promise to Blake. That is true. It's disingenuous for George Blake to say that, but I understand why he's saying it, because what else does he have to say? I've compromised him knowing they're going to be executed, but I didn't care. So in his mind, he has to know. He's a professional intelligence officer. He knows the history of the Soviet Union. He's doing it in one of the most dangerous times. He starts spying for Stalin's KGB, for God's sakes. Harry Shergold was certain that Blake was a double agent, but Blake would not break. 
As the interrogation continued, Shergold wondered how the most prolific spy of the Cold War managed to get away with it for so long. We weren't getting any sources inside Soviet intelligence because George Blake was preventing us from getting inside sources because he was telling them everything that the Americans and the Brits were doing. And so there were no sources to compromise George Blake. As the interrogation wore on, the exchanges became more heated. Harry Shergold was focusing in on Blake's final days in Berlin, where he had been running a deadly deception that cost hundreds of Western agents their lives. In 19... was moved from Berlin to Beirut. An accomplished linguist, Blake was now sent to study Arabic, but his stay would be short-lived. Anybody that becomes a betrayer is a half a bubble off, because it doesn't make sense to become a betrayer of the level that spies do. George Blake, when he becomes a spy, takes on an idea that he can beat the entire security and intelligence services of the West. And it's him against that entire system because any fissure in there can cause him to be compromised. That's exactly what happened on February 8th, 1961. Lieutenant Colonel Michael Golanowski chief of Polish military intelligence in East Berlin, crossed into the American zone asking for political asylum. It was a crucial defection for Western intelligence. The information he had clearly had a British origin, some of it. And the CIA communicated with their British counterparts. They held crisis management meetings. They el eliminated various sources of this information and eventually they narrowed it down to one officer, George Blake. The trick was getting Blake back to London from Beirut before he could bolt to the Soviet Union. He now received an urgent message to return to London for what was termed consultations. Was this the beginning of the end for one of the KGB's most successful super spies? Blake was immediately suspicious, sensing something was wrong. He now faced a crucial decision, return to England and a possible trap, or ignore the request and escape to Moscow, where he could hide the rest of his days behind the safety of the Iron Curtain. For George Blake, the moment of truth had finally arrived. Recalled to London for consultations, he was facing some difficult questions. Had his cover been blown? What would he tell his wife? Should he escape to the Soviet Union? Blake arranged an urgent meeting with a KGB officer. He was told it was safe to go back to England. Upon his return to London, Blake was met by one of MI6's most talented officers. As he got up out of the tube station, he met a colleague, Harry Shergold. Shergold suggested they take a walk across the park, and Blake says he knew the game was up because the direction they were heading in was Carlton Gardens, which was interview rooms where they debriefed foreign agents, they debriefed defectors from the various foreign intelligence services. Those rooms had microphones, tape recorders spooling away in an adjoining room, false walls, and he knew he was going to be interrogated. But it was all done in a very gentlemanly way. They were British. Blake, denying all allegations, was able to hold his ground for two days. On the third day, things changed. His chief interrogator, Harry Shergold, now took a different tack. He attempted to exploit Blake's one vulnerability, his deep sense of personal pride. Shergold told Blake that although he was certain Blake was a Soviet spy, it wasn't his fault. We could understand you were nearly three years in captivity with the communists in, in Korea. My God, nobody could stand up to that. We could understand, George, if you had decided to work for the Russians, if they so demoralized you, so beat you into the ground. 
George, we can understand. The tactic worked. And he said, no, they didn't beat me. They didn't demoralize me. I did it because I wanted to help them. I believe in communism. I believe in the future of communism. At last, Blake admitted to spying for ideological reasons. His bombshell confession sent shockwaves through the British government and its intelligence services. Well, I should think his colleagues were petrified because they didn't know what sort of information that had been passed on about them. And, and absolute horror that something like this could happen through the system. Blake was arrested and charged under the Official Secrets Act. He was tried, largely in secret, on May 3rd, 1961, at the Old Bailey Courthouse. Blake was sentenced to 42 years, the longest prison term in modern British history. What is interesting about George is that he thought he could confess and then they could just go on. Well, maybe they'll make him a double agent by doubling back. He was really shocked to find out that they actually arrested him. And then he was more shocked to find out they gave him 42 years. Soon after the trial, London's Daily Express claimed that Blake's sentence was appropriate, considering the number of agents betrayed and possibly executed as a result of his treachery. Certain people in the British establishment, particularly in the judicial establishment, took the view that not only was this chap a traitor, this was this, this sort of desperate waif from Holland who'd volunteered to fight for us, and we'd fed him and looked after him and trained him, and he bit our hand. He, gosh, that's frightfully bad form. Can't have that going on. Better make an example of him. While Blake sat behind bars, some speculated that his defection to the East, subsequent return to the West, and eventual imprisonment was an elaborate plot to dupe the Soviets. There is a, a rumor, it's never been any more than a rumor, that the whole of the Blake case was an extension of that brilliant operation in 1939 to 1945 called the Double Cross Committee where Blake was put up to do what he did, to deliberately mislead the Soviets. Phantasmagorical, but in the world, in the twilight world of intelligence, nothing is white, nothing is black. There's a lot of different shades of gray, though. And don't forget, Blake gave the Soviets a lot of information, most of it true. Some of it may not have been true. It has to be absolutely ruled out. It is just speculation of people who do not know anything or are just liars. It's even difficult to call Blake a Soviet agent. He is rather different from the others. He is a professional intelligence officer, and the Soviet Union was an ideal for him. Harry Shergold and his colleagues had reason to celebrate they obtained a confession, resulting in a record conviction. But one of the most spectacular spy stories in the history of the Cold War would take one more incredible turn. George Blake's record prison sentence of 42 years was meant to close one of the most devastating and embarrassing chapters in the history of British intelligence. He would now serve out his days at Wormwood Scrubs Jail in West London. There is a tradition in worldwide security services that when somebody from the other side is caught, after a due period of sanitation, they are secretly exchanged for one of our guys. And it happened all the time. But the British apparently were not prepared with the backing of the Americans they were not prepared to do a deal on Blake. Given the severity of his sentence and the unlikelihood of a spy swap, Blake knew he'd have to find another way of shortening his sentence. 
the ever-resourceful Blake befriended two left-wing activists who had been sent down for organizing anti-nuclear protests, Pat Pottle and Michael Randall. Well, my first impression was of somebody who was very reserved, very self-contained, um, and who seemed to be able to do his bird even in spite of, of this huge sentence that he had. Randall and Pottle agreed to help Blake escape once they were released. It seemed to me totally hypocritical to send a man down for 42 years for doing for the Soviet side what he had been trained to do for the, um, for the Western side. I mean, if you listen to Randall, you just got to shake your head and smile. I mean, here's a flower child in the 1960s who doesn't even know what he's dealing with. I mean, here's a major betrayer, a major spy, and he's offended because the guy gets 42 years in jail. Another key figure was Sean Burke, an anti-authoritarian Irishman who had been jailed for sending a bomb to a policeman. Burke, who was about to be released, helped smuggle a walkie-talkie into the prison. Once freed, he began to communicate with Blake from the outside. Late at night, Blake would turn his back to the door, lying under his blanket, plotting his escape. After three months of planning, the escape was set for Saturday, October 22nd, 1966. Earlier that day, a fellow prisoner sawed through the bars and broke the window Blake would slip through. Sean Burke drove his car to Wormwood Scrubs. After Blake made it through the broken window, he waited nearly one hour for Burke's call, desperately trying him over and over again on the walkie-talkie. No reply. A couple had pulled up in front of the prison and were making out in a car. Burke scared them away. When he returned, he switched on his radio to hear the pleas of Blake on the other side of the wall. Burke threw a makeshift rope ladder over the wall. Blake grabbed onto it and was up on the wall in no time. He let himself fall, landing awkwardly, breaking his wrist and slamming his forehead on the ground below. The injured Blake was bundled into a waiting getaway car. As they fled to a nearby safe house, Blake's co-conspirators anxiously waited for news. Finally, the phone rang, and it was Sean, and he was obviously in quite an excited state, and he said, I've thrown over the, uh, the line, and he's taken it hook, line, and sinker, something like that, sort of in a phrase, and he's standing beside me now. And I sort of doubled up, I was so, you know, it, it hit me so hard that we'd actually got to that point. Well, but, it was like the show was on the road, and what yeah. do we do now? It was up to Randall to find a doctor to fix Blake's broken wrist. A fellow left-wing sympathizer agreed to make a house call. They ended up getting the plaster bandages from a contact in the makeup department of the BBC. Incredibly, they hadn't planned what to do with Blake next. Someone suggested the Russian embassy. Blake rejected that, fearing a diplomatic standoff, or worse. That tells me there must have been a high level double for the Brits or the Americans in the Russian embassy in London. And having betrayed so many people himself, he wasn't going to stick his neck out and have it done to him. They spent eight tense weeks smuggling Blake to various safe houses around London, barely avoiding the massive police manhunt that had blanketed the city. They finally came up with a plan to smuggle Blake out of the country. They bought a camper van and called a carpenter who built a false compartment under the children's bed. Blake could hide in there. A young family traveling through France and Germany at Christmas time would not attract the attention of police or customs officers. Every time I've listened to him, I just smile 
because this is a guy who he doesn't understand the way the world really operates. So I don't think he understood who George Blake was and the consequences of it. And why would you put your children at risk with that and your wife? That was the biggie, wasn't it? Um, had to kind of not make that too big an issue because otherwise I wouldn't have done it. Eight weeks after Blake bolted from prison, they loaded up the camper van and headed to Germany. He crossed into East Berlin and was promptly flown to Moscow, where he received a hero's welcome. When Blake arrived in Moscow, it was naturally a day of joy for everybody in intelligence. One thing I have to stress, as a rule, all intelligence and counterintelligence services check people. Conversations are taped, correspondence is checked, they are watched. Nothing like that was done with Blake because we were absolutely confident in him. Blake, whose English wife divorced him when he was sent to prison, remarried and started a new family in the Soviet Union. He was highly decorated for his efforts. He became a Soviet colonel and received the Order of Lenin. Order of Lenin. If you look at the history of all the traitors, agents, whatever you want to call them, that the Soviets were running in that era. Very few of them, when they got back to Moscow, were made full colonels in the KGB. Very few. I think two or three. Blake was one of them. But Blake, who still lives in Moscow, has witnessed the failure of the very ideal he switched sides for. Communism has been overtaken by capitalism. I can't say what he's thinking in Moscow, but uh, I think he might be, a, on occasion, a very disillusioned man, that his ideals never prevailed. Despite the best efforts of George Blake, the Iron Curtain came down. It's up to history to judge one of the most deadly spies of the Cold War. In Britain, he will be viewed as a treacherous, repugnant individual who betrayed uh, many agents that we had working for us. I think Blake is the honor and pride of our intelligence service. Names like Blake's will never fade away. I have enormous respect for him. In the world of intelligence, George Blake is profoundly important. And if history is prologue, people should remember George Blake because he illustrates how important counterintelligence is and how you have to look for the betrayer. And as we look back in time, we realize that his betrayal did affect the course of history. Idealism is all very well. Well-intentioned idealism, there's nothing wrong with that but treachery that causes death. I wonder how Colonel Blake will feel at the moment of his death.